Today kicks off a five day interactive online summit called the World Carers Conversation, in which we'll be looking at the state of caregiving around the world in the era of COVID-19. You know, I think nobody plans, you know, when they're thinking about their life that rare disease or caregiving will ever be a part of it. I think we have had to really be um, strategic about what's important, what's not during this time. I think we've had to be very communicati communicative with our family and friends about you know, our extra caution, you know, thankfully the people that know us and know our story um, aren't, don't take that personal. They understand the importance of, you know, of why we're being guarded and careful. So I look at caregiving as an issue that, you know, this is a bit of a public health crisis that's now worldwide. And we want to provide funding for people that have to sometimes step out from their jobs to be able to care for loved ones. So you'll see that go across party lines. And that's actually been affirming <laughs> to Cameron's point to see just that bit of kindness come in at a micro and a macro level. Around the world, carers come from different backgrounds, different age demographics, and different economic and social situations. There is no one size fits all. Adapting to COVID-19, caregivers have to quickly adapt and learn necessarily skill to take on new tasks. Uh, how do you implement uh, social distances or staying home with people who need you to be at home? There's just so many things that you cannot control when you're a caregiver. Um, and it's scary, and I'm not sure what the answer is, but um, I guess it is don't give up hope and keep being innovative and creative. And um, you know what? We got through the rest of this. We got here for 27 years, and I guess we'll get through COVID the same way we got through the, the last several years. There are persons in situation of vulnerability with limit or sometimes no access to medical care, good services, and the impact for their people is much broader, limiting their access to cervic basics or to their rights to for social, economically on, on social rights, uh, because these people used to tend or used to be a victim of multiple discrimination. The mental health of caregivers has always been a concern, but it has been amplified due to COVID-19. Our caregivers are feeling overwhelmed, frustrated, and anxious. And as I mentioned before, part of it is also to making because they want to make sure that the need of the person they care for are being met during us during iso isolation, as well as protecting themselves and other family members. But for me, it was very surprising to see how hard it was to get family caregivers to talk about their perspective and their issues and how cancer had affected them. Because in their minds, it was like, how can I say anything about me when I have a loved one who is facing cancer? Interestingly enough, carers account for more than twice the formal work care force in Denmark and over 10 times the size of the formal care workforce in Canada, New Zealand, the United States, and the Netherlands. We all know someone either personally, socially, or professionally who is a carer. In my opinion, moving forward, Nadine, I believe that we all need to work together to transform society for carers in the same way that scientists and pharma companies across the globe have come together to find a COVID vaccine. We will work together to increase recognition and awareness of carers uh, within our own countries, but collectively, because as we work together, we have a stronger voice. The advocacy world in ARP and others uh, passed the CARE Act. That's not the CARES, but the CARE Act, saying that family caregivers needed to be recognized in hospitals. You have to ask every patient 
that is admitted regardless of their age or diagnosis, whether they have someone who's going to be helping them. And then do they want that person's name in the fam in the record, the medical record? And if they do, with permission of the patient, then you need to offer them guidance. And that is now passed in almost every state in the United States. What we're also doing here in Canada is that there's an increasing focus of using emotional intelligence to ensure person and family centered care is effective. So to complement the supports that are available out there, we're also building on the role of EQ in engaging and empowering caregivers by meeting at where the caregivers are at. The crisis has revealed just how little we have in place to support our caregivers to our collective peril, exacerbating every inequity in our society. From massive numbers of women leaving the formal workforce due to caregiving challenges, to the racial inequities that have disproportionately devastated Black, Indigenous, migrant, and other communities of color in the pandemic, to the incredible risks to our public health when caregivers are unable to provide the essential services safely with the support that they need and deserve. There are people who had, um, I guess, biases, not only about us as an African-American family and what resources, intellectual resources, moral resources, financial resources, whatever it was, whatever their biases were, um, that we weren't able to take care of a child like Joshua. Many Latinos who have been infected with the virus have refused to seek care from healthcare, from the healthcare system for fear of being deported or for fear of exposing a family member uh, to, to a, a risky situation uh, that might uh, have negative co immigration consequences. During this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Nadine, uh, pandemic has positively highlighted the role of that carers play, the vital role that carers play. With the window of opportunity that COVID is giving us now, we must put it in the political arena. So we definitely have to put it in the political arena because it's a necessity. And if we want to be a player like we're playing with Canada and the United States on the economic front, we also have to be a player also on the social programs that are needed. For global care recognition, this is the time. This is our window of opportunity to take this change. No two cases are the same. There's no bespoke model that you can apply. It meant that my caring role was also somewhat obliterated or the understanding and the accommodation and the respect that I've been paid for my caring role was obliterated. We don't have a voice as carers. Everybody is out and we're clapping every night for frontline workers and we're acknowledging how hard they have worked. Well, family carers are the invisible workforce who haven't been recognised. There is a tendency to hand over more and more responsibilities to, to families by, you know, recognizing them and, and, you know, and creating a few limited support measures here and there just to say, oh, yes, we do recognize carers and support them. Sometimes you don't even have time to fraternize with your cohorts and it sometimes affects your well, because you need to leave work, take some leave and come and stay at home and take care of a sick mother or a sick relative or something. And so it's becoming a whole lot of that we need to come together and then see how far we can help, especially the carers, because if you are not healthy, you can't care for anybody. Choice for carers is also extremely important. Obviously, we need to make sure that um, people who get involved in caregiving have chosen to do so in the first place. And you can see there that 78% of people are caring for people with greater needs, which also will have an impact on how we come out of this. We have a population that has greater needs, and so all the calculations of the kinds of social care support that you might see, of course,
impulse don't work anymore. They need to be recalibrated and recalculated when we go forward. Yeah, the thing that we need to continually highlight, I think, is that if you want to keep people out of hospital, if you want to keep people out of residential care, which will save the state a significant amount of money, you know, the cost of hospital admission is huge, the cost, you know, the cost of residential care is huge, then you have to keep people well at home. And to keep people well at home, you are going in some way to be reliant on informal care. So what did we do at, at Carers UK? We worked very much behind the scenes with government and the NHS to ensure that carers were included in advice, in legislation and were supported or as supported as we could get them. And we created new initiatives to help carers quickly. Parents and caregivers were suddenly thrust into the roles of teacher and round the clock caretaker, and these were still doing their regular jobs. I think that one of the things that uh, that has done for more women, especially in the African um, context, is, is giving you agency and giving you a voice to be able to say, this is what I want for me, this is what is working for me, and I don't care if it doesn't meet, it doesn't fit into the role that the society has carved for me. I cannot be a traditional, you know, look after everyone, my children, my family, um, in-laws and everyone and still juggle, you know, a career. So I'm going to get someone else to look after the family. Um, more people uh, are, are caring since the pandemic began. In fact, there are 4.5 million uh, new carers. Uh, and the majority of those uh, carers are also juggling work and care. So we estimate that of that 4.5 million, about 2.8 million are new uh, working carers. Finally, I think the working and caring piece, it's not going away. And isn't it great that people can continue to work and care? And the evidence is it's a really protective factor in carers' wellbeing. So let's enable that happen um, more into the future. When we talk about loss of income, loss of livelihood, women have been affected more. And many of these women feel like they are not supported. They are not getting the kind of support that they would want from their husbands or, you know, from the men in their lives. It's almost like caring happens in a hyper, hyper local situation. And it's difficult to know what's happening at a national level, and it's difficult to make comparisons across Europe, and it's difficult to make comparisons, you know, internationally. And if there was one thing that came out of COVID that would, over time, make a significant improvement, I think it is the collection of data on what lived experience is like. Has my life as a carer changed in pandemic? Yes, some immediate constraints were there, but the limitations of budget, the limitations of care options, the limitations of recognition, they are absolutely no different. So what it's done is it's given the rest of the world, the non-formal carer and the non-informal carer, an opportunity to walk in our shoes for a while and experience that. Well, I choose that we will look back on this year and say that was the time that things changed fundamentally for carers. As long as there are family, family care is there, people may not resort to old age homes. During that time, I could not have any break, could not go shopping to supermarket and could not do anything for myself. I'm also worried that my mother would contract COVID-19 by using daycare because many other users with dementia do not wear face masks. What happened was that the, the focus on fighting the pandemic became more consuming and any secondary issues like what's happening to family carers tended to get lost. Um, and, and we were unprepared for the fact that so much pressure was going to go on to families and that they were going to have to be much more independent. I think there was, uh, during the lockdown, a loss, a loss of support services like um, 
others have described that this morning, particularly for older people and people living with a disability. And um, I think there was a loss of access to carer support workers and allied health professionals as well, where they were unwilling to provide face-to-face -face services um, or carers themselves were actually unwilling to have people come into their homes. Uh, most critically, um, carers in China, they, they had very limited access to hospital care um, because hospitals, many of them were shut down or they only gave um, priorities to COVID related uh, cases. So a lot of patients who needed uh, surgeries or who needed prescription uh, medicine, they were not able to um, get those um, immediately. So carers, of course, they had to uh, shoulder a lot of the stress um, and a lot of the responsibilities. That was one of the things that was really stark and consistent across all the regions when we looked at the survey was how many, close to about 75% to 80% of carers expressing that they just feel burnt out right now. And that was in September. If a carer is stressed out, we feel that, you know, it's, you know, okay, it takes some time, it relax, take a deep breath. Uh, it, nobody really thinks it's a big deal. And because of that, uh, carers don't even want to talk about it because they feel that, uh, oh, why am I supposed to complain about it? Why am I whining? I'm, you know, just being very weak. When it is family bound in a rural area, it is neighbor bound as well. It is not, you know, the father, son and all don't take care of the neighbors come to assist. They will make food for them. Somebody will go and, you know, you know, one, one gentleman was telling me beautifully, when an old man falls sick, there are 20 other neighbors who escort him to the hospital because they care so much. Some rural cities, they have started um, something like share work. So maybe like, um, for instance, like if we live close to each other, we are both caregivers and then so we share our caregiving loads together. So they are sort of like collaborating um, and then sort of like taking terms and then they, they all embrace all their care recipients and together and then they take turns. And so we're basically sharing our uh, the caregiving load and also maybe some started, uh, for instance, uh, time banks and things like that. Uh, the time banks to help people, young people who have some maybe like after school or uh, holidays, they can care for older adults in exchange for um, other things that um, they can probably um, cash out later. So this kind of co-sharing intergenerationally or among neighbors, um, that's a beauty of what I see, a very positive side of, uh, of uh, pandemics uh, as a result. Since 2018, we actually uh, increased the budget for the older dementia care in community is almost 10 times greater than before. So it's a nationwide really good uh, source to access any type of care for the uh, caregivers. The ma majority of the people who call uh, the top three reasons were first they were they needed to know what kind of services available for their loved ones or second is that they were a, they, they needed somebody to talk to to um, sort of like spill out their the emotions and uh, to talk about uh, what, how hard it is and the third is actually increasingly more families are calling to seek for help to how to talk to family members, other family members, so they can take care of their um, their family loved ones uh, all together. Family sick leave actually is available up to 90 days per year. So if you have a really strong uh, a compelling reason to take care of your family members, you can actually use the sick leave uh, at work. And the respite care is available up to six days per year is mainly for the uh, caregivers for the uh, dementia patients in community too. The government introduced telehealth consultation, which I think um, consumers and various groups have been calling for for you know many, many, many years. Uh, that's now in place and we think that that probably 
um, uh, won't change, which is a good thing. I myself is a single child generation um, person. So um, I have to care for my parents. And if I were married, I would have to care for my in-laws as well. And I will have to uh, care for my children. So it's two um, people, a couple in their prime age, a prime working age, they have to earn a living to support all their family members. At the same time, they have to figure out um, just two person, how are they supposed to uh, take care of, um, you know, four elderly and then maybe two or more children. So that's a lot of um, financial stress to say the least and uh, a lot of physical stress. We wanted to prevent workers from, oh, these are like employ employees of any industry from taking off work because of caregiving. So we have some programs assuring them that they can stay at work while balancing their job between care and uh, working and uh, their own life. The idea of being kind has become a mantra. <clears throat> to have politicians standing up and saying, we all have to be kind to each other during this difficult time is something that we had never experienced before. And it feels like a, um, a, a shift in mindsets. And uh, uh, Carers New Zealand and other um, health and disability type NGOs are looking at that and saying, well, what about being kind to us? And is this actually creating some momentum and something that we could plug into and, um, and, and, and ride along? It's all very well to say be kind, but actually being recognised would be good as well. And if you're recognised, then being kind would be really good for family carers.